even though we pay no attention to it most of the time, we are completely surrounded by gas molecules, collectively known as air. Some of them we absorb to fuel our metabolisms. Others act like a blanket around the planet, trapping the sun's heat and keeping us warm. But the vast majority of them just hang around, not really doing much, except provide the atmospheric pressure we've all grown to know and love. But apart from making the planet habitable, the second best thing that the air does is it transmits sound, because that is how we hear music. In the last episode, I talked about resonance, starting with a single point oscillator to a line of them like a guitar string, and then a two-dimensional membrane like a drum skin. Now we're going into three dimensions, or a volume of resonating particles. But we're talking about air, not a solid, so these particles are really far apart from each other. In fact, the air molecules only take up about 0.1% of the space. But even so, there's still 27 billion billion of them in every cubic centimetre. And that makes modelling at all really complicated. So instead, let's just look at the air inside a very simple shape, like a cylinder and ignore all the rest. So let's get this cylinder and make it very, very long and thin so that the air can only move in one direction along its length. Then if I just tap the end, it'll bunch the air up and that compression will be transmitted down the length of the tube. It's not the particles that are moving down the tube. Each one of them is just bumping into its neighbors, but the compression is what moves down the tube and it moves down at a speed that's based on the kinetic energy of all the particles. So that's based on its temperature. So at about 20 degrees C, that pulse will move down the tube at about 343 meters per second. This is the same idea as a wave moving on a string, except now the movement of the particles is in the same direction as the movement of the wave. So it's a longitudinal wave as opposed to a transverse wave. And while a guitar string had a requirement that the ends of the strings be fixed, there are two options for the end of the tube. One is that it be closed and then the compression wave will bounce off it and head back in the other direction. Or the end might be open, in which case it's exposed to the outside air and when the compression wave hits it, it spreads out into that atmosphere and produces a low pressure wave heading back in the other direction. Either way, the returning wave will interfere with the incoming waves and produce a standing wave with nodes, areas where there's no movement but lots of change in pressure, or antinodes, areas where there's lots of movement and no change in pressure. The frequencies that are allowed to stick around inside a tube then are any frequencies that produce an antinode at an open end, where it has to stay at atmospheric pressure, or a node at a closed end, where the particles can't move. In the case of two open ends, that means all the multiples of the fundamental will be allowed to resonate, in the case of one closed end, it means only the odd harmonics are allowed to be there. So resonance inside a tube is the fundamental principle behind all wind instruments, from flutes and saxophones and clarinets, trumpets, and the voice. But what gets that vibration going in the first place, and what keeps it going? Well, you might remember from the first episode in this series that any random wiggle can be considered to be a sum of sine waves. So if you jostle the air around randomly at the end of a tube, what you're doing is sending sine waves down that tube, and some of them are going to be the resonant frequencies of that tube. So the easiest way to jostle the air around is to blow over a sharp edge. And what that does is it splits the air into two. Some of the air will go on the outside and some will go inside the amount that goes out and the amount that goes in will change randomly as the turbulence moves the air around. So this is the principle behind a flute. And flutes include silver flutes, but also things like tin whistles and shakuhachis and bansuris and recorder. A flute is open at both ends. One of the ends is where that sharp edge is, and the other end isn't down here, it's wherever the first open hole is, because that's where there's a requirement that the inside air is at the same pressure as the outside air. So that's where the antinode's going to be. 
and you can change where that is by covering over the holes and making that length of the tube longer. And once you've chosen a length of tube, you can still choose what note to play, and you do that by changing the characteristic of that turbulent air that happens at the beginning. Most of the other ways of getting a tube to resonate involve blocking off one of the ends with something that can vibrate, like a small strip of wood, a reed in the case of a woodwind instrument, or your lips in the case of a trumpet or a yidiki, a didgeridoo, or the vocal folds in your throat in the case of your voice. In each of these cases, the thing that produces that vibration in the first place isn't particularly big or loud or very musical sounding, but it will quickly produce a standing wave and a note once you add the tube. The problem is though that because you've blocked one of the ends off, you're only going to get the odd harmonics inside the tube. In the case of a clarinet, you just live with it. That's just the sound or the timbre of a clarinet is having those even harmonics missing. But there are some good reasons why you might want to get the even harmonics back again. And you can, it's just a matter of changing the geometry of the tube. So in the case of a trumpet or other brass instruments, you change the ends of the tube. So the bell and the mouthpiece. When you flare the end out, like on the bell of a trumpet, you bring the low frequency harmonics higher in pitch. And then the mouthpiece at the other end brings the high frequencies down because of its shape. So by squishing the harmonics closer together, you eventually approximate the full range of harmonics that you would have started with if you had two open ends in that tube. The problem is you can't now add holes along the length of the tube to make different notes because you would need to put that same bell shape on every single hole. So instead, with brass instruments, they use valves, which add extra length of tube in the middle. The air either flows through the valve directly, or when you push it down, it gets bypassed through an extra length of tube. A saxophone gets its harmonics back again by changing the entire length of tube from being a cylinder to being a very long cone or a conical bore. There's a tricky way you can get a clarinet to sound more like a saxophone, and I'll let Lindsay describe that for you. The silly sax. So the silly sax is a uh, design of mine, but it's based on a new principle developed by Yamaha in their workshops. And by putting a branch tube, it means that we're once again back to a wind instrument which is open at both ends. Let's just plug up this branch tube. Sounds like a clarinet in that slow register. But let's unplug this branch tube. Totally different instrument. And by far the most flexible wind instrument of all is the voice, with a myriad different ways of changing the tube's shape and length and the different resonant cavities that you can use from your mouth to your sinuses to your chest. It means you've got a huge range of tonal options to work from. So now that you know what a note is and how you might produce one, in the next episode we'll go to two notes, making what's called an interval and see why when you play two notes simultaneously they might sound in or out of tune with one another. But that's all for now. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I make a video every week and YouTube thinks you might like this one in particular. A big thanks to all my supporters over on Patreon. You're amazing. If you'd like to join them, please follow the link in the description. And to all of you, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.